<clears throat> okay, uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Piero Minardi. I'm uh, chairman and president of uh, ABVCAPI, Brazilian Venture Capital and Private Equity Association. Uh, uh, very uh, happy and pleased to have all of you with us. Uh, and I will pass to Robert Linton to to start. Uh, on behalf of the ABVCAPI and our 200 uh, uh, plus uh, uh, members, I, I, I appreciate your time and hope that this will be very uh, useful for all of you. Thank you very much. Please, Robert. And again, I uh, have a, a wide range of um, participants today and uh, it's, we're looking forward to putting together a very interesting panel. I'm very lucky uh, to have three of not only the largest but most active Brazilian private equity programs, Global House, a regional house, a local house. We have all the bells and whistles to talk about uh, today. And, and the, the main topic is effectively how is the private, e private equity and the private capital markets in Brazil, how, are they, how is it reacting to the three crises in play today, the health crisis, the economic crisis, and, of, and on the local side, the political crisis is being felt uh, in Brazil. And um, of the three participants, we will have uh, Bruno Zaremba, who is the head of um, Private Equity for Vinci Partners. Uh, we'll be having Piero Minaj, who has just spoke, is not only president of uh, ABV Cap here in Brazil, but also is uh, the leader for the private equity and for Warbur Pincus in Latin America. And to start off with, um, Luis Fernando Lopez from Patria Investments, based in London, uh, is partner and chief economist and strategist. He's going to give us a few slides to go over some of the general themes that we're going to be talking about and to try to put some perspective on where we are in, in this whole scheme of things on a more of a macro sense, not only the, the numbers for GDP and, uh, and, and for the foreign exchange, but just to give a feeling as to what it's been like in the past, what we've seen in the past, and where are we today in the midst of the COVID-19 crisis. So, Luis, if you wanna kick off and, um, and then push into those slides that you were talking about. More than happy, Robert, thank you very much. So let's see if I can do this right. So here we go. Oh, oops, better. Okay. No, better make it uh, to share. Let me go back. First okay. one, we'll go into the health ramifications first. Okay. Where Brazil is. Mm hmm. Well, some problem here in my. Okay. That's Click on the section. Yeah. And anyway, we'll be getting the, the main focus point for this, all Luis is putting it forward, is to put a perspective of, of where Brazil is in its turn, in its moment for the, in terms of COVID, in terms of actually the, the health side. We'll start with the health okay. side and then move more towards some of the economic numbers. Here we go. Can the, 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 the screen is, the slide is showing all right? Yes, it is. Yeah. Okay. There we go. Sorry Perfect. for that. Okay, so let's start with the, the COVID-19, the footprint. So what the basic message here in this slide, on left-hand side, um, the table, um, the way we put the information, it's a little bit different from what shows up in the, in the news um, services. Um, uh, basically, the stories tend to focus on the absolute, the total number of cases, we, we doesn't make much sense if the populations, uh, the size of the populations are very, very different, which is definitely the case around the world. So we rank by a million of people that died you know, in term, because of this uh, pandemic or uh, total cases per million. So what you see in the first column is a little bit different. So actually the worst case is not the United States or even Brazil, which do register the, the, the largest cases in absolute terms, but actually Belgium or Spain or here in the UK, it's actually much, much worse. Um, what you have also uh, information going is shown the table further to the right, if the countries are past the peak or not. And then um, last uh, information is mobility index. I think almost everybody's looking at that. So we had lockdowns, we had social distancing measures, and then this gives us an intuition how close to coming back to normal are uh, each economy in the sense that um, zero here means that you are back to where we were before this pandemic hit the countries. 
and on the minus number, uh, the, 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 the bigger is the minus, uh, the more distancing measures are still there, more lockdowns, so on and so forth. So that's the mess message. Uh, where is Brazil in this um, picture here? Uh, we are in the not, not in the worst zone or the most critical zone, if you take the, 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 the ratios in the first column. Um, but we are not yet past the peak. Uh, we have in early indicators that we may be peaking around early June, although Brazil's peak is going to look more like a plateau rather than a peak, this sharp spike and then uh, um, fast uh, slowdown of, the, of this outbreak. It's not going to happen in Brazil. And the reason it's going to you stand longer than, that longer than longer, expected. Longer, yeah. Probably the tail off in terms of having very few cases uh, death or reported case is going to be by uh, November. So there are some countries in which this is going to happen as early as July, August. Brazil probably is going to be a case in, uh, for, for November. And the reason is, if you look at, pay attention to the, to the chart on the right hand side, the COVID-19 in Brazil means very, very different stories. From, from the north, for example, we had 306, million, uh, 306 people dying per million of, of population, which is more than twice the average ratio. But that, that there in the north, at least, the, the, the outbreak seems to be stabilizing. The critical question whether the stabilization has happened, the inflection point has happened or not, has to do with the northeast, the NE, and the, uh, the southeast regions, which are the most populous in Brazil. Um, although they are pretty much in line with the national average, um, there are some states in which you can definitely say that the work is over. For example, the largest state in the south East, which is Minas Gerais, the worst is over. There is very few. Uh, the pace of new cases and the pace of new death is, is, is going down significantly. Um, but in other states, not Sao Paulo, that's not the case yet, and Rio de Janeiro. And then last but not least, uh, we have MW, which is the Midwest in Brazil, and S, which is the South. Uh, look at the numbers. There is no typo there. Um, the numbers there are a small fraction of the national average. And there is, um, the, there is no, no discussion that, that the worst is over and the curve is already stabilized. So this gives you an intuition that basically COVID-19 means very different stories in Brazil. So if you combine everything and try to say when the combinated numbers are going to stabilize again, probably early this month, um, because of this uncertainty regarding or this stability regarding what's happening in the Northeast and in the Southeast, uh, it, it will be more like a plateau rather than a peak, and then we are going to see um, slowly uh, the, the curve um, right. going down. But so how do you see this as, a, as the economic, economic impact? Until, the economic yeah. impact, yeah. What happens here? Um, the most important part of the agribusiness in Brazil and a good chunk of the mining, which is very important in the industry, especially for, for Brazilian exports, they are located in the south and the midwest. So actually, right. if you look at the numbers, there was no crisis there. Um, we can discuss it a little bit, but basically, um, grain production in Brazil is going to be all-time high this year, to over 250 million tons. Um, Agribusiness is booming. If you take prices received by producers, they, ha they haven't seen any deterioration in commodity prices at all. Uh, actually, mm -hmm. the average prices for producers are up over 20%. Uh, but the problem is Brazil is a domestic economy mostly, so this speaks of the domestic market, the consumer markets, which are stronger in the southeast and the northeast. Mm -hmm. So that mm -hmm. probably would take a little bit more time to recover. Probably that's a story for the second semester, not for this second quarter. So for, in terms of the impact of the pandemic in growth, part of the economy has not been affected at all. But the, the domestic market is, is, feeling, is still reeling from the, from the impact. And that's probably that's the story of a more protected recovery yeah. throughout the second semester. I think you'll find that uh, forward to the second slide, and we can see some of these, uh, the perspective of the impact in terms of GDP. I think this is a, a very important slide to see where we stand in terms of previous. Walk us through this, please. Yeah, more than, more than happy. So what you have here is basically we, we browsed all the economic history of Brazil over the past 100 years or so, and then we this showed what are the worst crises. So this has uh, a couple of world wars, plus the Great Depression, plus domestic crisis, for example. We had the, recently the impeachment of President Dilma Rousseff. So the two basic messages here is that uh, do, have we ever experienced 
something similar to what you are seeing right now? And the answer is, unlike some news uh, which say, no, this is unprecedented. Actually, the answer is yes, we, we've seen something similar. The question is, if you go to the bottom of the chart, we just showed that there's 1918. Uh, by then we had a, a full impact of a global epidemic, which was the Spanish flu, plus an, a, a big external crisis that was the First World War. Brazil entered the First World War towards the end of the, of the conflict. So um, if we were to answer the question, how the economy performed, of course there was a, a deep downturn, but it was minus 2%, uh, which was actually smaller than the average impact of the World World War and the Spanish flu, if you look compared to United States, Europe, and other countries. We think that the final impact is going to be somewhere in between these numbers there. Um, the 12 you, so, so from, from Patrick's point of view, your, your headline estimation, I don't want to put anyone on the spot here because everything's changing so rapidly. Every week we have different dynamics of velocity for the change and for the crisis. But if you were looking at, um, and I'll take a quick uh, straw poll from Piero and also from Bruno on this, um, your view, for Patrick's view for GDP growth for this year, uh, mm -hmm. will eventually turn into, and how you see that for perhaps, give also a, a feeling for how you see it for 2021 and 2022. Okay, we think that the number is going to be probably mid-range between all the numbers you see there. So it's something close to minus three point something. So we definitely are more optimistic than consensus. Consensus in Brazil, that's gonna be a, a, a plunge, a deep downturn, something like 6%. Yeah, central and then bank. bouncing yeah. back. Yeah, yeah, central bank's consensus, um, and then bouncing back in 2021, something close to 3.5. We are seeing this 3.5 negative this year, something close to 4% next year, basically because we see some parts of the economy already um, uh, bouncing back, which is basically the agribusiness and, and, and a good chunk of the mining. And we think that the global reaction and the domestic reaction to the crisis throughout the second semester and going into 2021 uh, is going to be a little bit better. So nobody, okay. nobody is going to crack the champagne with, say, minus two point five, but at least uh, it's not going to be the worst crisis ever experienced in Brazil, in our view, at least. Okay, uh, just a just a quick straw poll, Piero um, and Bruno. Piero, why don't you kick off um, uh, from your point of view uh, and from Warp Pinkus's point of view, at a global perspective, looking at Brazil. What is your more or less average estimate for what you think GDP for this year will be and next year? And feel free to, <laughs> you're, you're on mute. Uh, I, I, can, I can start here. So uh, Bruno, you start. Yeah, so, so our numbers in Vinci, they are around five to six, down five to six. Okay, so you're more in line uh, with like the BCB focus report. Yeah, that, that's what, okay. that's what our, look, our, our numbers are looking like. Obviously okay. the dispersion, the, I think to Luis's point, I think this is a, the, the point he touched before, I think it's a very important point uh, because within the country, we have regions that are not being affected. So if you look at the south of Brazil, uh, we have like a numbers that, like Florianópolis, for instance, we have a company that ha is headquartered in Florianópolis. Mm -hmm. uh, in Florianópolis, we have n n almost no cases, right? It's really uh, a completely different situation than what we see in the southeast. So you have a tale of several different Brazils at this stage. I think right. what we need to, to be able to accomplish as a country uh, is to allow uh, regions of the country where we are not seeing so, so, uh, so significant impact to reopen right. and, uh, and, and be able to produce, right? Okay. Because I think we, we were very harsh across the board, but really the qu qualitative between the states, they're very different. So okay. I think this is an important point because w when you look at Brazil as a whole, the picture on the on the on the state level is very different than what you see as a as a balance for the entire country. Right? Okay, so just on focusing that. on the just focusing on the GDP view, Bruno, just very quickly, and tell me you're seeing around maybe five five and a half percent down would be the consensus from the BCB, but you see this flipping back in 2021 to what kind of level? Same thing as a central bank, more like three and a half up. I mean, Luis is the economist here. I am an economist by training, <laughs> but not by like a, a well, it's just more of a house view, right? It's just a, basically the house view, I guess. Yeah, I, I, I think, I mean, economic theory says that the, the rebound, it tends to be magnified. Uh, I mean, if you have a very sharp decline, you have a very strong rebound. 
Mm -hmm. So I think we're likely going to have a, a good rebound. I think the most important discussion is not, again, to look at GDP as a whole. I, I agree. think the discussion is to look uh, sector-wise, right? Because yeah, and I, t I totally agree with your point that it's looking at the, at the details, the regionalism of Brazil is great disparity. I talk about Brazil being a mixture of Belgium and India sometimes. It's like there's all kinds of... But anyway, well, Luis, going back to you, let's talk about the... Um, go, going back to overall, the viewpoint from GDP is going to see a significant down, but definitely a, a V-shape type recovery. We're looking for three and a half percent maybe for coming back into 2021 and then 2022 flattening out more towards like a regular letter, level of growth of two and a half percent but in terms of the you know you bring up the the foreign exchange um and also the bovespa as relative values walk us through where we are now so what the message so asset prices we all know they they, they have to be forward looking so what we are doing this slide here is just looking at the market effects on the left hand side and how the bovespa the stock market the listed equity is doing on the right hand side so it's an index so we start with a hundred in the beginning of every crisis and we have plenty of crisis in brazil over the past few years so we, now we have the covid 19 which is the black line we had, for example, an energy crisis on the Argentina default and the market panic that preceded the election of President Lula, 2001-2002, um, global financial crisis, so on and so forth. So what we are measuring here on the left-hand side is the hit on the currency. So moving from 100 to less than uh, a little bit over 70 means that the currency lost 25% of its value against the US dollar. And then you compare this hit with other crises and then what we do with the exercise is not only com comparing the steepness, but then looking afterwards, 12 months down the road, 24 months down the road, what yeah. happens if the currency now follows the same path that it did in previous crisis? There was further depreciation, the currency flats out or it appreciates. And then the message here on the left-hand side, there was a steep depreciation, but that was not the, the steepest one. The, the currency did not take the, the worst dive ever. So, but for example, the global financial crisis was worse than that. We, we had the, the, the currency depreciation faster. And there were other crises like the, the red one, which is basically the, the Russian meltdown. And then afterwards, the, the floating of the currency in Brazil. There was a point in time that the currency has lost 40% of its value. We don't think it's going to be the case in Brazil. But what the currency is doing right now, and this feed is for just to put people, everybody on the same page and, and to um, uh, introduce you to Brazilian FX volatility if you haven't been introduced yet. Now it's trading at five. Uh, so there was a sharp appreciation over the past couple of days. And then the currency is telling a story that basically this crisis is not going to be the worst ever. And then the Brazilian external accounts probably are going to improve because of the story that we are starting to tell about the agribusiness, very strong exports. Uh, exports in Brazil are going to be up. The trade surplus in Brazil is going to increase 10, 11% mm -hmm. here, while the, there is a global downturn. So the message here on the currency, yes, we have problems. Um, we have political noise. We are going to discuss it in the next slide, but it's not the worst crisis ever. And the discussion is whether the, the equilibrium point now in the short term is going to be five real to the dollar, if it's going to be a little bit more depreciated, if you're going to go back to the four threshold or not, if it's going to stay at, at the level we are seeing right now. But most well, Luis, important- Luis, just a, a quick question, rebuttal for that. Um, when we're looking at the current crisis, which has now become a mixture of three crises together, the economic, healthcare, and also um, political crisis, is there any parallel, and, and to say that there's a parallel in the past is ridiculous. Let's say the history is more of an echo. It gets repeated as an echo. It doesn't get repeated in itself. But is there, of these five scenarios we're looking at here, just even on this graph, would you consider it is more likely we will go down the line of one or, or the other options just because it's a bit more similar in terms of it, it, it's, for example, this crisis perhaps is less economically driven, domestic economy driven, like uh, the 2001, 2002 crisis was more domestic driven problems. This being global problems, perhaps this is more similar to um, the situation in the 88, uh, in 98, 99. What, what would you feel as an economist that this is more likely to follow in terms of dynamics? Um, this, lo this crisis looks more as a combination of a major global shock 
and there is right. at this stage um, a good component of political noise. So it's going to be probably a mix between the red line, the global financial crisis uh, of, two, uh -huh. of 2008, and the, the rule set impeachment. Uh, because okay. we cannot explain prices just with the two crises that you mentioned, just the health crisis and the economic crisis. No, I Brazil agree. Has I agree. Better, it's it's better not a fair question. <laughs> no, it's not a fair question. So it's there is not a, a fair question. question. I'm just uh, getting your feel, <laughs> feeling on that. In terms of uh, Bovespa levels, you've you've mapped this out as well. Um, it, the same logic applies, basically. It's it, it's a it's basically, a new. But then, uh, true. But then we have clearly um, a more um, impressive um, inference here, so so to speak. Uh, if the, independent of the, regardless of the crisis, probably the worst is over for, for Ibo Vespa. And the, and the uh, couple of days make even more difference for Ibo Vespa because when we, we, we send this data, because you have to do this beforehand for, to, to organize the event, it was trading at 81,500, so roughly. That's right, yeah. And now it's, it's over, nine, nine, over 90. So the, and it very much replicates what happened in the global financial crisis. You can, can barely distinguish between the COVID-19, which is the black one, and the red one, which is the global financial crisis. So it, it, it is performing pretty much the same, which means that if, unless we come with another crisis, could be political, we are going to discuss this in a, in a minute, uh, unless there is a, something new, uh, the, the, that, that seems to be more room for recovery than for a downturn. Right. Okay. That, that's certainly, that's certainly, again, I think the same elements apply. We're going to see just what, what type of elements will be taken into consideration and at what point perhaps we decouple from the U.S. rally uh, or the U.S. driven and the global rally, which is clearly, clearly been surprising. And they say this is the most hated rally of all time <laughs> because people can't explain it and they're not happy with it. But anyway, um, Luis, move on perhaps to the, uh, the, the final side, which is the political overtures at you uh, about governability. Now, that's probably the most complicated thing to forecast. So economic growth, um, the, the disease or the outbreak of the COVID-19, there are some models, some quantitative things with some margin of error. In terms of politics, it's, it's very tough to see what's happening. So what we did here is basically we mapped it um, the GDP, that's the, the GDP in real terms, starting with 100 uh, by the end of the military ruling, and then where we stayed by the first quarter of this year. So the, 220, the 220 gives you an idea that basically real GDP more than double uh, over the time. And then we have all the not so beautiful faces here, our president um, elected since the end of the military ruling. And then the message here is basically, um, there is political noise in Brazil in all governments, all of them. So the president takes office and he's in for a number of political crises, that's for sure. But then the performance of the government, and if it's the government is going to end actually, because we have two impeachments in the, in the new term. So uh, if assuming that you can see the arrow here, the cursor, this is first impeachment color in 1992, second impeachment, our first um, female president, Rousseff in 2016. So what the, key, the four key variables that define the fate of each administration, assuming that crisis happened at first, how the economy looks like. Um, if the economy has a decent perspective of recovering, which means getting job, jobs back, currency stabilization, um, so on and so forth, the government tends to survive. Second variable, which is also critical, how the government deals with the Congress. Very few people realize outside Brazil how powerful the Congress is. Yes, because that's not usual in emerging markets. In Brazil, the Congress is very powerful and oust presidents. Uh, has already uh, uh, booted two presidents in Brazil, and that's the way it happens. So the Congress is very powerful. So it's important for, the, to, for the, the executive branch to have some kind of functional coordination with the Congress. And then the two other variables that are not that fundamental, but they are worth uh, tracking. Does the president has a, 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 a job approval rating that reflects core, uh, die-hard core supporters, people that like the president, almost regardless of what the economy is doing, the political analysis, so on and so forth, that's important. And then variable number four, uh, for the average Brazilian, which is not a very sophisticated guy, uh, if there is an accusation against the president, it's worth being something really ugly. Because if the, the, the people on the screen do not understand exactly what's going on, and assuming that the other variables are not performing that badly, even accusations that sounds horrendous for the upper middle class or for the 
um, opinion makers, um, people tend not to, to take it very seriously. So, Would you forward, say the current situation is reflecting that with Bolsonaro? Is, is that, would you get that feeling that it's perhaps not as the severity of the accusations seen by the common people is not as much of an impact? Yeah, so going from, the, from number four to number one, severity, how serious is the accusation against the president for the average Brazilian? Not at all. That's horrible for the upper middle class, the media, opinion makers, but all the opinion polls show that basically Bolsonaro now moving to the, to the variable number three, he has a, a kind of uh, diehard supporters at around 30%, 25 at least, probably 30% of the population support him because of the values he defends. So the guy is law and order, conservative, family values, so on and so forth. So uh, in terms of the president having 3% popular support, like for example, Dilma Rousseff had before being impeached, mm, very difficult to see that happen. Political right. articulation was his weak spot but now President Bolsonaro is working hard to, to align with the center of the political spectrum, uh, which is called in Portuguese, we call it Centrão. So it's working hard to, to create a functional coalition in the Congress. And then the economic outlook that probably uh, we discussed the rest of our uh, event today, uh, it, it's bad right now, but around the globe, nobody can, can boast that it's, the, the economy is performing really well. So it's actually about how the economy is going to recover or not from here on. If there is decent recovery, uh, like for example, uh, the one we had after the global financial crisis, that's what's happening here. So it was a deep downturn, but the economy recovered fast. Uh, Bolsonaro will come clean out of this until he, of course, gets in, in himself into the next crisis, which is going to happen. That's for sure. Right. Well, the, the key here is talking about the word, the key word here is governability and the ability sure. to, um, to push through important reforms that are still on the table and still being and, and other initiatives that may well be dreamt about, such as uh, the privatization pipeline and the concessions pipeline and the, the critical mass that needs to move into infrastructure. Um, and we will get to that and we'll talk a little bit about the sectors, but the key word here is governability and, and to see uh, what the key factors are going forward. And I think we can move into talking about some of these, uh, some of these areas as we, as we go forward. So, what I'd like to I'd like to drill down a little bit now, having talked about the the general overview uh, that we see where we are, where we stand. The important thing for us now is to move more into where are we in the private equity context um, relative to this macro side. And I think um, I'd like you each three of you to go through your house's macro view where we see ourselves in this in this moment, and then drill down a little bit into some of the sectors you're looking at. And, uh, and also how your portfolio companies are working with that. So I think, uh, Bruno, why don't you kick off? Um, we'll go into um, a little bit about, uh, tell, tell us a little bit how, how Vinci is generally looking at the perspective. You mentioned a little bit about being more in line with consensus on, on macro growth, but how does that drill down into your portfolio, uh, your portfolio companies, how they're reacting? And then we'll talk a little bit about sectors as well. Okay. Uh, I think probably the main, uh, the main positive su surprise for me of all of this uh, situation was the way that the portfolio companies uh, responded. I think we had, uh, I, 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 couldn't, I couldn't be happier. I mean, looking back about three months ago when we, we started quarantining in Brazil um, with the way that the portfolio companies uh, responded. Obviously, they are in very different situations, depending on, as I said, depending on the sector that they are. I think here is really, I mean, this first part of the, of the quarantine is a sector call, right? There's really nothing. Depending on where you are, you have been more impacted by the factors that Louise mentioned. This is a, it's a, it's a crisis that has an, an interesting aspect because it's a combination of supply and demand, right? So, uh, with supply constriction and demand being hit by by unemployment and, and things like that. Uh, but supply has been the one that has had the most impact so far. Uh, we had obviously constraints in regards to uh, operating hours and the ability to open uh, right. stores. And, uh, and, and I think now we're going to go into probably the more demand side which has to do with uh, income and behavior, right? Uh, so if, if customers are, are gonna come back and, and how they are, they're gonna behave 
and if eventually uh, job losses will have some impact on their ability to to spend and how they they redirect their uh, their their available wealth, let's say. Right. But I think so far, um, as I said, I think the the the, the the surprise in my view was very positive. I think the, the 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 management teams did a very good job. I think it was very clear uh, in this particular crisis, at least in my view, how uh, private equity is able to add value because we created a crisis committees across the entire portfolio. Uh, we share good practices. So if one CFO found out about eventually, uh, because we had a lot of legislation that was passed, right? So and very uh, detailed legislation. So if you have like tax uh, tax breaks, depending on the type of tax that you uh, pay and you have the ability to postpone some of those tax payments. So it was very difficult to stay on top of everything. So the fact that we have a network and uh, that the management teams and ourselves, we, 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 we added, I mean, all of this intelligence in one place, I think this allowed uh, the, the portfolio to react uh, quicker. Right, you were sharing right, strategies right, across the board. So most of the strategies you were looking at at portfolio company level were quite similar in terms of emergency measures. Yeah, at the end of the day, I mean, uh, I mean, safety in the beginning, uh, liquidity, uh, uh, redu reduction of uh, cash uh, burn uh, in, the, in cases where we had a more severe revenue impact. Uh, and now we're coming, now it's, it's starting to come back. Right, so over the past couple of weeks, we've seen already uh, important improvements. Uh, so, as I said, in the south, we're almost back to pre-pandemic levels in the activities that we have in the south. Uh, in the in the southwest, it's starting to open up, but we are already coming back. Right, so now the question is the slope and if there is any impact from consumer behavior, wealth but we're already past the, the, the more significant moment, in my view. Of, of, the, of the sectors that are currently in your portfolio, you have a wide range of, of investments, but some of the more headline ones, such as uh, Domino's, which is clearly a, you know, a food retailer that, that has its own dynamics, but are there any particular sectors that you would say have reacted better and others worse because of this particular SNAP crisis? And it, you, yeah, obviously you, I, you visualize it a lot more from your portfolio company. So start, start with no, that. Clearly, yes. So I think, I mean, we, we accelerated trends that were already, already in place in, in the digital side. So everything that had to do with digital, uh, like our long distance education company, Domino's, in which we have a very large uh, delivering com component. Uh, so so in, in those cases, we've seen an acceleration. So in Domino's, Domino's is a good example. Uh, we used to run the business three months ago with about 50% delivery uh, and 50% uh, on-premise consumption. And of that 50% delivery, about 17 was through our own app, right? So between the app and the internet. Um, we are now up to 75% delivery and our app has gone from uh, 15, 16 to 39. So right. this was something that we expected to happen in the course of the next, I don't know, two years. And it happened in two months, right? Right. Uh, and I think a lot of these trends that were expected to happen over a course of time uh, were accelerated. Uh, now the question is, uh, the consumer is creating new habits. So how many of these habits and how much of this is going to stick once people can uh, move around, right? Right. Uh, probably not a hundred percent, but I, I would bet at this point that most of this acceleration would stick, right? So st stories that have some uh, component of digitalization and uh, mostly on the B2C side, I think that was the most impacted one. Uh, right. We had a discrete shift and probably about 18 to 24 months of uh, uh, advance in a couple of months, right? That that's the well. That's, we a, that's a clear that's a clear theme across the board is the acceleration of change, the pace of change. Yeah. Expecting something that would take two years um, to go forward. Uh, Piero, um, talking in terms of Warburg Pincus, we we have an extra element to bring in here, which is the global. But if we can just focus on Warburg Pincus in Brazil, just for this uh, analysis of 
of sectors and um, what's what's been more impacted, what's been less impacted uh, from your current portfolio and looking ahead, how does Robert Pincus view the sectorial positives and negatives from the impacts of COVID? Yeah, thanks. Uh, I'm sorry, I, I, I was cut off uh, because of my connection here. So I, I skipped the, the question about the expectations of macro, which was very convenient for me. So I let it. <laughs> I'll get you on that later on. Fernando. Uh, <laughs> I'll come back to you at the end, just thinking uh, about that one. <laughs> yeah, but, uh, but I think that uh, pretty much I, I think the impacts are very similar to what, uh, to what Bruno said. Most of, uh, most of private equity investments in Brazil are are related to growth and are related to to to, uh, uh, to the domestic service economy. Brazil is a 80 80 percent or or so a service driven economy, and most of the investments that you see are, are are focused there. There's less of industrial, so probably different from China. From my own experience at Barbara Spinkles, just to touch is where we see recovery, but we see most many investments. Uh, 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 related to, to to production, to uh, uh, infrastructure, to the, com the, the the country's focus on 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 these things. So you you see manufacturing coming back, and that that has a clear effect on the on, on the speed of the recovery of those economies. This Brazil is much more a service oriented economy with a strong bias towards commodities and and agribusiness complementing that. So that's that's how, some, somehow also determines. The, the factors that make these recoveries uh, different uh, from country to country, no, no question about it. Uh, we have a portfolio, first of all, and, and then just uh, one step back here is the fact that uh, 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 private equity like ours uh, and like Bruno and, and, and Patria, I mean, in the end, we invest on the micro, not on the macro. I mean, it's probably 75, 80% oriented on, on, on bottom up good companies. And when you're a country like Brazil uh, with the you know, possibility of scale in business to 100 million people uh, diversified, when you saw on Luis Fernando's uh, 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 comments, I mean, the whole the different dynamics from different regions, uh, growth, et cetera. I mean, this, this, I mean, this has got to be very, very much micro oriented. You know, macro should play a role. We can discuss here what is going to be I mean, 20, 25 percent of the decision, but it's much more micro. I mean, we're not highly dependent on specific sector or anything there. So I think. Yeah, would, is, Pierre, would you summarize that as effectively saying that the ecosystem for private equity in Brazil, which is bottom up, looking at the micro opportunities within sectors and within a global economy, would you say that 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 the ecosystem today is what it was before and will be again in the sense of productivity gap and the legislation? Tributary. You spend a lot of time going to Brasilia, talking and negotiating and lobbying for for the industry on the tax side and the regulatory side. Would you say that that overall fit, uh, toolkit for private equity in Brazil is as strong as it was, and and perhaps might even be more so? What were the I, elements of the ecosystem? No, I think the ecosystem is well strong, established as many of of, of, of you know. I mean, it's been around for more than 20 years, uh, have been important, incredible evolutions in terms of creating the ecosystem, creating a strong group of uh, players, uh, uh, fund managers, local, international, who came here, who established for long, who uh, invested, made money, lost money, but I mean, very solid in terms of not only of that specific uh, uh, group of people, but also service providers uh, going anywhere from lawyers, uh, uh, consultants, auditors, etc. Uh, a very, I think, friendly legislation in terms of capital markets and liquidities uh, issues. We never had any type of uh, 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 restrictions to capital inflows, outflows. We don't have specific, we don't have situations like specific countries where, I mean, sometimes like you look at China, many, many companies in China, they want to do IPOs in Hong Kong because they're specific. Mm -hmm. We don't have this type of things. It is a very solid environment. It's very well established. It's very well regulated, despite of the problems that we have or with uh, specific points here and there uh, that, you, that you refer to in terms of 
you know the 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 the, uh, uh, the IRS and, and things like that, which which we're gonna sort sort we are about to sort it out honestly. Uh, oh, good. That's it's, always good to hear. But <laughs> yeah, no, it's uh, it's it's uh, we we had some we had some good evolution at the end of the year. We're still not there yet, but we're gonna we're gonna hopefully uh, get. Yeah, there. but uh, as as a, as an overall summary, the, the ecosystem for private equity in Brazil is now more mature, and so it's been it's been going for longer. And you'd you'd have to say that there's no particular evidence of any shock or negative element that could come Absolutely. from this crisis that would undermine, shall we say, the interest of private equity going in forward the, or put us in a different form. I, I don't see any, but uh, just in case you... In, 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 in the contrary, I think part of the work that we're doing at the WVCAP, here speaking at the WVCAP, is uh, uh, pushing and showing that the type of capital that private equity presents, uh, 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 and it is, and the availability of capital in the world, I mean, should be one of the tools that this uh, government should consider in terms of uh, uh, reopening Brazil uh, or uh, attracting this capital to, to long-term risk capital. The, type, the capital that we represent, that uh, represents 50% 50, 50 of all IPOs that happened in the Bovespa point and us in the last uh, 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 14 or 15 years, et cetera. And this is the capital that we need to attract that is uh, ready and available and Brazil can offer and it offers a lot of opportunities and a, a lot of stability and structure to this type of capital to come to Brazil to help building companies, to help uh, or accelerate the recovery, to help uh, uh, de bottleneck the infrastructure, etc. So, I yeah, mean, especially this, in this infrastructure. Is a, this is an incredible, unique opportunity for not only Brazil, but also for this capital to come and, 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 and make history and make and make profits and helping uh, rebuilding the country. We are, uh, this this is part of the work that we have here. I mean, in terms right. of in terms of the sectorial then things what we see happening uh, uh, that we see happening here again. So towards what we're saying is the fact that the recovery here is highly dependent on the domestic market. I think Luis Fernando pointed very well uh, on how this domestic market and this uh, service industry is going to recover. Uh, this is going to be determined for particularly for private equity investments and who can forecast where these speeds go and how it's going to happen, how much uh, 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 wealthy will be, will be uh, affected and how, when people are going to be back spending and willing to spend and what type of service. Well, like that. Piero, that's, a, that's a good point. With a long-term view that you're allowed to have theoretically with private equity investments, this is the one thing that perhaps we have to disassociate the private equity world in Brazil to the Bovespa and liquid capital markets world where it's as if we have a certain luxury to look long term. With that in mind, would you say overall focusing on the micro that perhaps this the impacts of the crisis aren't as dramatic on a sectorial basis where you're thinking I'm not going to look any further in that particular area direction because I know that's going to be adversely affected. I mean, obviously we're not talking about investing in airlines or investing in cruise ships, but and would you say as a general point that perhaps because we have enough time to look forward to see we're going to see us coming out of the crisis later on that that would involve perhaps that um, sectoral analysis isn't quite so essential it really is just bottom up no, I think in the end it's like I mean it's going to be different recovery for different sectors and different situations right and and and, and, and trends that's as Bruno point out uh, correctly point out different trends that they, they come and, and come to stay and it's going to be up to each one appetites and uh, 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 theses but there will be enough interesting theses uh, in different sectors that make sense mm -hmm. including including sectors that you mentioned I mean this is I mean tourism and this is a country that uh, has a huge potential airlines yeah. I mean etc cetera, etc cetera. I mean this is everything's on the Table, honestly, right? I mean, good. Now, well, in fact, that, that segues perfectly into we have a question from um, from the audience. You know, I'm, I'm not going to say no names, but this is a this is a this is a government institutional, very very large and important uh, private equity investor here in Brazil who's mentioning this is a question over to Luis and Luis segue this into your thoughts on on agribusiness as a sector as well. Uh, you'd mentioned the improvement of external accounts thanks to a trade surplus in agribusiness. Um, is there is there, isn't there also a negative impact in tourism? And will the surplus be sufficient to balance the negative impact from other sectors? So will the surplus of ag agriculture help really be enough to balance from other sectors? Obviously not, because we're gonna have a negative number for this year, but how do you mm -hmm. see that? Yeah, it works as a cushion, uh, a powerful, significant cushion. So we have the, the first half of the year, definitely domestic market services that Pierre rightly uh, stressed it. 
are not going to perform well, but then you have this, this cushion, this buffer that will reduce the, the overall uh, impact on economic activity. Just to give a few numbers on this agribusiness, how, how interesting, or how a completely different world it is. Not only affects specific regions of the country that are not having the, 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 the severe impact that the Southeast and Northeast are having, but two numbers. This, this year, Brazil will have the largest grain production ever. So there was not any meaningful impact of the COVID-19. It was if it never existed. So we are going to harvest over 250 million tons this year. And then you could say, wow, this is interesting, but uh, are people going to harvest? Do, do we have the return in terms of prices? And that's another story that has to be corrected. So we, we go to Bloomberg or Wall Street Journal and then they say, well, oh, commodity prices are collapsing. Actually, not quite so. If you take the average, the total uh, commodity index, it's going down. If you take the first four months of this year over the four months of last year, actually the price is going down in dollars on average 14.5%. X fuel, they are 2% up, which means that basically, except for oil and gas, commodity prices are not that bad. But then you have to factor in the currency depreciation, right? If you're a Brazilian producer, you have international prices times exchange rate. Average prices received by Brazilian producers in the agribusiness went up thus far in the year 22%. So these guys are making a ton of money. They are going to export over 100 billion US dollars. So in terms of the trade surplus, it much more than compensates for the tourism, that's for sure. But Brazil actually is not that strong on tourism, which is a shame. Just to give you another piece of evidence, there are more people visit or there used to be more people visiting the Eiffel Tower in Paris than Brazil as a whole, 8 million people. That's, that's the, the number. So Brazil was not that strong actually, but in terms of the trade surplus, more than compensate for the tourist deficit, for sure, doesn't compensate for the deceleration of the local markets, at least in the first half of the year. In the second half, however, if we have a recovery, and in our portfolio, we are starting to see some interesting stories in terms of domestic spending picking up, then you have a combination of local spending or consumer spending reviving, plus this agribusiness story, which is a very, very strong tailwind. That's why we are tend to be a little bit more optimistic on how the economy is going to perform this year and the carry over the momentum into 2021. Luis, uh, how does this, uh, Patria, uh, in fact, uh, all three of you are looking at infrastructure investments, but um, Patria, with your specific, with your fund, um, with it, within the agribusiness segment, how are you seeing infrastructure investments and, and the potential pipeline for infrastructure investments fanning out to not only serve that segment of the economy, which is robust and booming, but also Brazil as a whole? What's the, the Patrick view on, on the infra infrastructure sectors that right now? Has this changed much because of the crisis or is it really just the same path? Well, there are always risks. Of incredible, incredible necessity. Yeah. There are always risk investing in Brazil. We have the political risk and the political noise we just mentioned. There's the currency thing that we also address it. We think that the risk much more than compensate, uh, sorry, the return much more than compensate for the risk by a large margin. First, because as again, Piero pointed out and Bruno as well pointed uh, very well, um, doing what we do in infrastructure in Brazil is basically this private equity approach into infrastructure. We don't invest in mature infrastructure just for the yield. We pretty much create the infrastructure assets or we do a significant brownfield. Um, everybody that played infrastructure or private equity, the traditional model, which is very aggressive leverage buyout, doing financial engineer in Brazil at least has not survived. So what you, they, they are not around to tell the story, uh, as simple as that. So what we do is to go micro, very correctly. We don't do major macro plays and try to see those sectors in which the legislation, the regulation is supportive to private investment or there are some changes that will support it. And in addition to that, there is a significant productivity gap that if you do a decent private investment, you can unlock significant value. Um, if you go to agribusiness, you can check all the boxes. The, if the regulatory framework is very good, um, the, the value that you, you can unlock if you do proper infrastructure there is tremendous. And the only thing that is missing, you have to have the right approach because nobody likes the risk of, for example, you do infrastructure and then you find yourself drilling oil. That's probably not the best proposition. It's better to provide infrastructure service to commodity producers, and then you can diversify, you can see, 
produce uh, deliver infrastructure services to oil and gas, but also to mining, to grain production, to animal protein, so this live, uh, live stock and so on and so forth. So that's probably the best approach. And it has been mm -hmm. paying out because, again, going back to some numbers, uh, over the past 30 years, productivity in the agribusiness sector in Brazil, the CAGR is uh, 3.5%. So every almost so, every yeah. year, there is a 3-4% increase in productivity. And Which is not being seen in other sectors. Other sectors are not seeing that rise in productivity. We're still stuck no. at the levels we were almost 20 years ago. Bruno, from, uh, from Vinci's perspective, um, you're also looking at uh, investments in, in infrastructure. Would you um, uh, give us your, your quick point of view uh, on you know, what, what you're seeing as opportunities in, in infrastructure as, as a whole? Yeah, I, I'll come back to, just before that, I'm gonna come back to what Piero said. I think Brazil has an interesting, and this is true for everything, right? So for infra, it's true for private equity. Uh, our setup, historical setup, uh, was built in a way that the local institutions didn't invest heavily uh, in alternatives, right? So this was basically uh, because of crowding out from the federal government. So we had a very yeah. high real interest rate. So didn't really, they didn't really need uh, to, to invest in alternatives because they could get their, their required returns by just buying federal bonds. Uh, and this created a, a situation where you have, as Piero said, you have an industry with a lot of experience, right? We, we, we have been around for 20 years, I think Patria, us, Piero, so it's really, you have more or less two decades of doing deals in Brazil, uh, but with a very limited amount of capital, right? So the alpha pool in Brazil is very big. Uh, and this is true for private equity, it's true for infrastructure. Infrastructure, we are one of the top 10 economies in the world. It's a continental country. Uh, and the amount of capital that you have available for investments with a private equity mindset is, is really, I mean, almost zero, right? In, in the infrastructure, we had another problem because the setup before was that the construction companies had uh the market share from the investment side and this was broken about a few years ago right uh so today you have a very very significant funding gap uh in infra you have a very significant funding gap in private equity uh so the alpha pool is, is pretty big uh and you have a and very a much demand, uh, and a huge demand from from government from municipalities for the needs of infrastructure it's a huge no demand. infrastructure we have we have continental needs it, I mean, any project in Brazil is billion, is a few billion, right? It's really, we are a very big country. So the amount of capital that can, we can absorb is very significant. What we have been doing in, in, uh, in Vinci on the infra side is that we have launched a few, of, uh, a few listed products. So we have been working a lot in the past few years on the tax, ex tax exempt side both on real estate and infra. So we set up and we launched, I think it was the first uh, listed uh, tax exempt uh, infrastructure product. So it's, 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 it's it has a different focus than the one that Luis mentioned because uh, uh, our, our fo for Patria, our focus is more on yielding assets and we right. repay, we, we, we give that, uh, we give that yield to our shareholders with tax exemption, right? So it's Bruno, long. Bruno, would you would you say though, with a little bit of adding in a little bit of pepper, shall we say, of uh, financial ingenuity, new products and new ideas? But the main driver behind this demand going forward could easily be summarized by the fact that the real interest rate has come down to an unheard of level. So we're now looking yes, at yes, of course, yeah. So so the parallel that the parallel that I like. Uh, is using the United, the United States are very good examples for us in several different sectors, right? Brazil, the, the customer behavior, etc. We, we tend to mirror a little bit uh, what the, the U, U.S. does with a 10 to 15 year delay. Uh, and we use them for inspiration a lot uh, over time. And I think on that particular front, uh, remember that the, the one of the the original responses from the financial crisis back in 2008 was the original, let's say the first QE uh, uh, 
initiative from the US uh, Federal Reserve. And part of that was the collapse of interest rates to zero, right? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> it was the first time that they had interest rates very close to zero. And this, this was 12 years ago, right? It was in 2008. And taking, uh, uh, looking at uh, just one example, which is the one that I have on the top of my mind, right? So, so I'm gonna use this one, but I, I, I believe the, the market mirrors a little bit this example that I'm gonna give you, right? So Blackstone in 2008 had about 85 billion in AUM, right? In 2008, rates went to zero and they have been zero since then, right? I mean, the long bond is very, it was very compressed and it hasn't come back and now it's even lower. Uh, so we saw a very strong move to alternatives because right. traditional yielding assets, they had, uh, I mean, at that point we had a, a, sh a, a return a shock, right? So mm -hmm. the returns were not uh, more, uh, any more attractive at that point. So we saw, a very strong move to, to alternatives. Which is continued uh, in Black for the past decade. It's continued for the past decade. So, so 10 years, exactly, point. yeah. 10 years of, of, of uh, shift, right? Blackstone today has about 570 billion. So yeah, they went from know. 85 to 570 billion. This was 12 years of zero return on fixed income, right? Basically. And people moving towards alternatives, right? Uh, and this so, is true for, for Blackstone, I'm giving Blackstone's example, but other alternative market. managers also grew, right? So the, 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 the segment of the, of, the, of the asset management industry grew quite substantially. Brazil, we're going to that point now. I got it. I see what you we're mean. going yeah. to zero yeah. rates now, right? Yeah. So you, uh, so you, but, but we do have, we have the infrastructure and the ecosystem of the private equity market is capable and available to exactly. receive that and we're only 0.2 percent of gdp so no i totally agree exactly. there. I, I don't want to cut you off just yet but we're getting towards the end of the session i mean this has gone by so quickly there's so much to talk about but I have to respect the uh, the time limits but i want to just get a quick roundup from all three of you just very quickly about a you know one minute sharp uh reduction of your thoughts at this point looking ahead and situation now and looking ahead Piero, kick us off well, listen, uh, from our perspective as private equity, I think it's pretty much what we discussed here. I, I think there is a unique uh, uh, opportunity and a very uh, uh, large and interesting field to be explored by investors uh, and by funds. Again, the ecosystem, as we pointed out, but it's not, I mean, it's always good to reinforce. It's very well established. Uh, it's uh, made of competent and uh, uh, well-proven investors who who can really and will benefit uh, uh, from the moment and the opportunity uh, on a country that offers opportunity for the type of private equity that we're discussing here, there. So I think from, from the industry, I mean, we're gonna go from here to, uh, 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 to, 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 to the next level in a much better, in a much better shape, with much, much more opportunities uh, uh, on the table. Uh, I think it can be fueled by the type of money that Bruno is uh, describing. Uh, uh, a lot of local money, which needs to reallocate it, and 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 for the benefit, and for the blessing of this local money, pension funds, the ecosystem will answer. Uh, with quality for their needs. They don't need to create the private equity or the alternative assets industry from scratch. It's already there waiting for them. They're regulated and well, con well controlled, very transparent. Luis, and, and quick, yeah, Luis quick, quick summary from you. Let me unmute first. Um, okay. Basically, um, messages, um, returns more than compensate for the risk if you have the right approach. Um, you don't need to imagine a brave new world to invest in private equity in Brazil. No need to um, fancy with very different theses. The world is going to be completely different. Brazil is going to be completely different. More of the same uh, cautious approach, uh, discipline, capital deployment, selecting more micro theses that are resilient to the macro environment. Um, I agree with Piero, probably it's going to be a very, very good vintage for private equity investment in this country. Excellent. Bruno, final, final comments before we wrap up? Well, I, think, I think, I mean, I'm going to 
kind of take take a little bit out of what Piero said. I think we are, we, I mean, we have strong managers in Brazil that have been making money for quite some time. Uh, the industry is still very young in a sense because capital uh, has been constrained uh, over time. But we have very uh, favorable returns. If you look at the, the, the top, let's say, five to 10 managers in Brazil, that have been around for 10, 20 years, the returns are very competitive, right? So I think we can we can continue to tap this alpha pool for quite some time. I think it will take time for our market to be uh, competitive enough uh, to, to, to limit the returns. Uh, so, and I agree with what, with what Luis said. I think that the, this vintage, uh, again, we, we, we had the situation back in 2015, another uh, blip in our road here. We're gonna have another one now. Uh, so hopefully people are, are, are going to be able to preserve some of the value that have, has been invested, uh, which I think it's possible given the, the very strong bottom on nature of our activity here in Brazil. And we're gonna see a lot of opportunity going forward. So uh, at the end, I mean, the alpha pool is pretty big. So it's, yeah. it's more than enough for a lot of managers to make uh, uh, excess returns in the Brazilian market. Perfect. Well, again, thank you. Thank you, all, all three of you, for, for taking your time to, to speak to us. And uh, thank you to the audience also for your questions. Apologies for not being able to answer all of them because there was a number that came through at the end. But um, uh, I think it's a, it's a sign that we're looking at it just from a macro top-down point of view. We could spend another two or three hours talking about the micro bottom-up view, strategies and tactics that could be used for executing and, and uh, squeezing more return out of uh, Brazilian portfolio companies going forward. But anyway, uh, in name of ABV Cap and uh, Brazilian private equity industry as a whole, thank you three for coming and thank you everyone for participating and attending. The, the live will be posted to um, all the people who signed up. We had over 130 names signed up, including uh, 30 institutional, global institutional investors. So um, all of you will be receiving a copy of this recording. And um, please enter in touch with us if you have any questions or about the material or want additional contacts with either of the speakers or the industry itself. And again, thank you all for participating and uh, good day to everyone. Thank you, Robert. Thank you. Thank you. Pleasure. <laughs>